Well, good morning. It is so great to see all of you this morning, and I am excited to continue in our Exodus series. I have to tell you, as I was reflecting last week, as Pastor Aaron was going through Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, and we get to see Moses encounter the burning bush. And in this miraculous moment of God visiting with Moses and saying, hey, I've heard my people, and I'm sending you, and I'm going to go with you, we see the very human response of Moses, are you sure are you certain? Is it, I don't know. There's got to be somebody better. And it all ends with Moses stepping out in obedience, right? We, we ended with Moses stepping into obedience and returning to Egypt with his brother Aaron and God saying, I'm going to be with you. And he goes and walks into obedience. And Pastor Aaron left us with a reflection question, one that I have just been messing with me. And that was, where in my life do I have mistrust for God that's preventing me from fully being obedient to him? And I was, as I was wrestling with that, I was also asking the question, when are the times that I feel the move to a new place of obedience from God a lot of times? And can I say, for me personally, it's been in wilderness moments. I don't know if this is true for everybody. It was true for Moses, but, and it's true for a lot of people we see in scripture, but it's in the midst of a wilderness moment that I've often felt a call to move somewhere different, to, have a, a, to take a step of obedience in a way I had not before. Before Jesus and after Jesus. It's been interesting. And what does it look like to be in a wilderness moment? Well, we have this diagram that we've been looking at. And uh, so we'll get it up here on the screen. And this diagram is just kind of given what a wilderness experience is. You know, circumstances that lead to suffering, oppression, uncertainty, what we are experiencing during it. We're disoriented, diminished, discouraged. You know, why are reasons we might end up in wilderness season? Well, sometimes it's our own decisions, right? The reality of sin in our own lives and the decisions we make can lead us to wilderness moment. The real reality of the people's decisions impact us. What people decide to do and how people decide to move can lead us into wilderness moments. And then there's just the reality of living in a broken world, grief, death, things happen and it leads us to these moments of wilderness. And you know, it's been in the midst of these wilderness moments that I have really encountered God's grace. Before I came to know Jesus, it was the wilderness moments that slowly brought me to him. Before I came to know Jesus, I would sum up who I was with two things. I wanted to control the people in my life and control my environment so I could experience as much pleasure, pleasure as absolutely possible. That's who I was before Jesus. I don't like admitting it. I don't like that that's who I was, but that's the reality of who I was. And because of that, you can imagine where that would lead me a lot of times. It would lead me to places of broken relationships, of destruction in my wake, and of wilderness. And it was in the midst of that that God would meet me through my parents, God would meet me through pastors, God would meet me through my youth leaders and everybody else, and he slowly, through his grace, was bringing me into a relationship with him. I'd love to tell you it only took one wilderness moment for me to be like, that's it, I'm all for Jesus, but sadly that wasn't the case. It took a few, but eventually through the grace of God, I came into a loving relationship with him. And I am so excited to be able to be here and to be able to declare what he's done in my life, but also to walk us through what he's doing in Moses' life. But you know, can I say this? Even after coming to know Jesus, it's been in the wilderness moments that he continues to call me to further obedience. I remember a specific time almost six years ago. I want to, ex to explain that we were in a wilderness moment, my family. My wife and I were having communication issues. There was just a lot going on. We were struggling. It was a rough patch in our marriage. It was just a hard, difficult season. And not only was that happening, but we have three daughters and they got a lot of their father. It's a shame. The reality is they are strong-willed, determined, independent women. That's what they say anyways. Independent. And then I'm like, okay, well then you can do your own dishes. You can, and no, not that independent. But here's the reality. They are very determined individuals, very strong-willed, and we were having just a hard season of parenting with our three daughters. And on top of that, we had close friends that were like family, very close friends. And these close friends, um, we were going through a season of just grief and betrayal and different things, and we were losing that relationship, and it was just falling apart. And it felt like everywhere we were trying to enter into, whether it was our marriage relationship, parenting, or friendships, it just seemed like we couldn't get anything right. 
It was a crazy wilderness season for my wife and I and our entire family. In the midst of that, we got a phone call from Department of Family Services. And it was this simply, we have a four pound preemie at the hospital. His name is Whitley and he needs a home. We don't have any other place to place him. Would you be interested in being a, uh, an emergency placement for this young boy? We got off the phone and I immediately say, there's no way. There is no way we can do this. It is not possible. There is no way. And so Laura in her infinite wisdom said, let's pray about it. And so we prayed. And it became very clear that we needed to go meet Whitley at the hospital. And so we went to meet Whitley and I held him and he was so big and so small that he could fit like right here in my palm and I could hold him like this. And in that moment, it became very clear that we were being called even in the midst of a wilderness season that was tough and hard on our family to step into obedience and become Whitley's foster family. It was clear to my kids, it was clear to my wife and it was clear to me But the reality is this, and it comes to our big idea as we walk through Moses in Exodus 5, is in the midst of wilderness seasons, obedience may deepen our hardship. Actually, can I be honest? Most of the time for me, it's deepened the hardship. Yet it paves the way for God's purpose to unfold. Billy Graham says it like this, true success is measured by our faithfulness in carrying out God's will, whether through triumphs or trials whether through triumphs or trials. And when we were ending our time with Moses last week, he had returned to Egypt. He was with his brother Aaron in the end of chapter four. He is meeting with the elders and they are excited. They believe he has had a vision from God and they are celebrating and worshiping together. And I gotta believe there's this moment of encouragement for Moses. He's like, oh, this makes sense, God. This call to obedience makes sense. But then we get to chapter five. Verse one, in his first encounter with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. If you want to follow along, we're going to be in chapter five of Exodus, verse one through five right now. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is this Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. I don't know why I love this interaction so much, but like Moses and Aaron go in knowing Pharaoh is gonna reject them because God has already told them I'm gonna harden Pharaoh's heart. I don't know if they expected it to be as hard though because they had a follow-up, right? He said no the first time, but maybe he'll give us three days. Just let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to worship our God and then we'll be back. But of course he says no to that too. And then you see that Pharaoh, I don't know if he's getting a sense that there might be hope with the Hebrew nation or there might be things moving there and he's getting a little worried about how this might impact uh, his slave labor in essence. And so he's like, okay, we gotta figure this out. So he invites those that oversee the Israelites, the slave drivers of Egypt, and he brings them in and he talks to them and he gives them some instructions on how to, make thi- how, how to respond Uh, to the Israelites in the midst of this. And the purpose of this, we see in verse nine. And if you read along, it says this, make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to the lies. Pay no attention to the lies. So Pharaoh's like, we're gonna oppress an oppressed people already more so that they're so busy and so discouraged And we're going to tell them why too. We're going to make sure they know why it's happening. We're going to do this. So in the midst of this, in the midst of this, they have no time to hear what Aaron or what Moses have to say or the elders so that they would not be able to listen to them. And why 
what is the big deal here? Well, you know what? Can I be honest with you? When we walk in obedience, it's gonna lead to criticism and opposition in our lives. And this criticism and opposition is something that Moses knows is coming. Because he knew when he went to Pharaoh and went to talk to him that this was gonna impact them, this was gonna affect them, and they were gonna oppress them. So he knew this, but I wondered if he knew how it was gonna work out. Like, I think Moses probably thought that the oppression was gonna happen to him. The, the opposition was gonna happen to him, but instead of it happened to the people. And as I've reflected in my own life, isn't that true for us? When we take steps of obedience, it impacts the people closest to us. You know, one of the hardest things for my family as we transitioned here in obedience to what we thought God was calling, what we believe God is calling us to do, and that's why we're here, was my oldest daughter, who's 13, who had to leave all her friends that she's known her entire life. The hardest part of my obedience was the hurt and the pain it caused her. She's thankful for the move now, praise the Lord. But at that time, it was such a devastating thing for her. And it was hard that my obedience, what I felt God was leading me to do, had such impact on her. But that's the reality sometimes. As we step into obedience, we hope it only impacts us, but the reality is it impacts our family. It impacts the people around us. It impacts the church community sometimes. The reality is as we step into obedience, we're not the only ones that get impacted. And so how do the Israelites get impacted? We read a little bit further in verse 10, and we see exactly what happened. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what the Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw, and the slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Now, some of you might be asking, why don't the Israelites just do it without straw? It's totally possible it is. There's archaeological evidence. But it was probably something that the Israelites had a high level of expectation with their bricks. Because, yes, durability went way down if it didn't have, like, a fiber binding it all together. So they needed something like straw to bring those bricks to the standard of what the Egyptians wanted. So now they didn't only have to dry those bricks, make those mud bricks, but now they had to find a substance to replace straw. So how did they do this? You know, I wish this was in scripture and we can only assume, but were they having to uh, to sell their possessions? Were they having to take food or feed that they had for their livestock? Were they having to work extra jobs? Were they just having to beg and find scraps? Where was this all coming from? We just don't know. But it obviously was making the workload heavier and heavier and greater and greater. And with this, the overseers that the Egyptians had appointed And can you imagine being in that position where you're one of the Hebrews and you're in a place of authority over them and you're trying to make your masters happy and when your masters aren't happy, you're the one that's getting beaten. And you're the one that has to take, you're the one that has to demand your fellow countrymen do the work. I can't even imagine the situation they were going through and they were beaten and beaten. And how many days was this taking place? We don't know. It's a few verses, but was this months? Was this weeks? Was this days? As they were suffering in this? We just don't know. There's not a lot of clarity there. But the reality is the overseers get to a point where they realize there's no way we can make the quota. This is going to continue to be our life. Something has to change. And so what do they do? They go before Pharaoh to ask for mercy. They go before Pharaoh and they say, hey, if your people would just give a straw, if they would give a straw, this would change. We can make our quota. And Pharaoh's response is, you lazy people, get to work, in essence. And the reality is at this point, they know there's more here than meets the eye. They know this is not gonna change. They know this situation is here and they feel the discouragement, the despair. And as they leave, in verse 20, they encounter Moses and Aaron. When the overseers left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and put a sword in their hand to kill us. 
So opposition or criticism and opposition is not only coming from the outside, from Pharaoh and the Egyptians, it's now coming from the inside, from their fellow Hebrews, from the Israelites. Think about this. Think about how this had to feel. Now Moses is getting opposed from the very people he came to rescue in obedience to what God is calling him to do. He's being rejected by his people, not only by those on the outside. I think most of us expect people on the outside to uh, oppose us and criticize us because they can't understand why we're stepping into obedience. But a lot of times we don't expect it from the inside. We don't expect it from the people that believe the things we do, that are followers of Jesus to be oppose, oppose us. But in the reality here is can, just a moment of transparency is I've stepped in obedience throughout my life. It has been the people inside the church that have been the greatest forms of opposition and criticism. It has been the people on the inside rather than the outside in a lot of situations. And I've wrestled with that. I've wrestled with what that means. I've wrestled with what that looks like. But it's been family. It's been friends. It's been close confidants. And it, there's a difference between somebody that's helping you discern God's will and somebody that's telling you God's will. There's a huge difference between those two. Unless it's from scripture and then they have the authority to say this is what God says because that is what God says. But it, there's a huge difference between those two. And it has been my experience that a lot of time opposition and criticism when they come from the inside, it's almost more damaging than the outside. I would say every single time. Because the reality is Moses and Aaron know opposition is going to come from the Egyptians. But I don't think they expected the opposition that came from their own people. And they blame Moses and Aaron for the situation. And I don't know about you, but in moments like this, moments like this feel incredibly lonely. And I believe walking in obedience can lead to feelings of loneliness. They can lead to feelings of loneliness. This is just a reality. And you might be, am I stretching it here thinking that Moses felt this? wait until we get reading on in scripture. I think you will agree with me that Moses was feeling very lonely in the midst of this. But it leads to feelings of loneliness. Actually, what I would tell you is when we're stepping into obedience, especially in the midst of a wilderness season, which it most often is gonna make situations harder before they get better, the reality is, is we're gonna feel a lot of negatives. And as humans, we have what's called a negativity bias, which means, science has proven this, that when negative experiences happen, we have a greater emotional response to them. It is why I vividly remember my mid-high years over other years in my life, is because they were consistently negative. Like, I remember the awkward school dances. I remember the awkward this, that, and anything in between. And I just remember it vividly. If you go back in my life, my, I would love to tell you I remember every vacation, every trip my parents took me in. I had the greatest parents. But I can tell you pretty much every argument, every intense moment, every time where things were said that shouldn't have been said. I bet my kids can do the same. Because the negative memory recall is just so heavy. My brother had uh, open heart surgery when he was little and I was little and there, there's no way I should remember it but I vividly remembered the waiting room as we waited to hear how my brother's surgery went. You know, I think about, I think about the fact that when I'm in a crowd of people, I notice people that are angry or frustrated first, like their facial expressions come off that way more than I notice people that are happy or neutral. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I tend to pick up on that. And the impact on relationships, right? As I was growing up, my, my parents would always say it takes five positives to make up for one negative. I'm sure you've heard that before. The reality is uh, they look at more and more, they're like, well, it depends on the negative, right? Is it traumatic? Because there are a lot of different things. Can I be honest? There's been some negative situations in relationships where I don't know if five positives are going to be enough. I just don't know. And that's why I love the gospel so much because the gospel says you don't have to forgive on your own power. You don't have to enter into that relationship on your own power. No, through the power of the blood of Jesus, you can be forgiven and you can forgive others. You can enter into that and know what healthy boundaries look like and you can enter into that relationship and love in a really unique way, in a godly way. And that's why I love the gospel because the gospel says we don't need to stay stuck in our negativity bias. No, Jesus wants to redeem and transform us and change us. Actually, Richard Foster, who I love reading a lot of stuff from, probably 
too much sometimes. He says this, the measure of success is obedience and devotion, not public acclaim. What if the greatest step we can make is not worrying about the results of our obedience, but just taking the step of obedience? What if success is not how things turn out, but the fact that we were willing to step into obedience? I couldn't even imagine how different Whitley's life might be different if me and Laura didn't say, okay, we're gonna step into those obedience in the midst of this wilderness season. And as I talk about Whitley, I wanna make something very clear. Laura and I are very passionate about fostering and being there for those that have no home. We're passionate about it. But at no point in time do we want you to think this is an elevation of us. We had no business being Whitley's parents right now because we didn't have any capacity. If anybody gets the glory and the adoration of our choice to do that, it's God. It's him. All we did was say we were gonna be obedient and step into that. And can I tell you, we got pushback and we got pushback from inside and outside during this, trans- during this time. And as we got pushback because people cared about us and they saw how crazy our lives was and they were logical decisions. As we got pushback from people and I think if we would have stopped at any point, people would have been like, I get it, that makes sense. We ne- he needs a different family. They would have understood. But the reality is this, Acts 5.29, I love this. The disciples are getting persecuted for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they have one of my favorite responses in all of scripture. And it's just this, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. We must obey God rather than human beings. And I think the question comes down to this, is in moments in the wilderness when we're called into obedience, it becomes very easy for us to listen to human beings. Because human beings are offering something that's usually easier than what God is offering us to enter into. And sometimes we're tempted to hear what they have to say over what God has to say. And I'm not saying, there's a lot of people in my life that help me discern what God's leading. But the question is, is I'm really listening to God and seeking him in the midst of this. And yes, it's gonna lead to hardship. It's gonna lead to difficult times, especially in the midst of the wilderness season. But the reality is he's there with me along every step of the way. You know, my favorite part of this chapter is actually the end. And I I think you might think I'm a little twisted for this being my favorite part, but Moses in his angst, in his feelings, cries out to God. Exodus 5, verse 22. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people and you have not rescued him at all. You have not rescued them at all. I don't know if you can hear it, but Moses is not very happy with how God's operating right now. And I love the honesty here because there's an invitation here for us to be honest with God. You know, the midst in the process of Whitley, there's this reality that we don't know what the next step is gonna be. We don't know what's gonna come. We don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know if in two weeks, a month, three weeks, whatever, we don't know if he's gonna go back to his home. We don't know if his family is gonna ever be a safe place for him. We don't know what anything's gonna look like. And God invites us into those moments of obedience without knowing the destination, without knowing how the results are gonna look like. And in the midst of those seasons, what the reality of is walking in obedience can lead to seasons of discouragement. Walking in obedience can lead to seasons of discouragement. I would even strongly say this, because this is my experience. Walking in obedience will lead to seasons of discouragement. It will. There are gonna be times we're discouraged. There's gonna be times we're struggling. There's gonna be times that are hard. And there's gonna be times just like with Moses, we're crying out. Can I tell you, there were moments where Laura and I were trying to be faithful and obedient. And that obedience was meeting with Whitley's mom. That, that obedience was meeting with his grandparents. That obedience was inviting their family to be part of our family. There was times where that was the obedience, but in the midst of that, we were still crying out and saying, God, please, if there's any way possible that the boy we've come to love could be our son, please. But at the same token, you're wrestling with that and you're going, no, God, I want his mom to get it back. I want his mom to make those choices. I want him to be with his mom. And so you're wrestling with this and you're praying very two different things and you're wrestling with the emotions and the feelings in the midst of the call to be obedient. 
And I gotta tell you, that leads kind of to my reflection questions today. Where in your life might you be given up too soon? I just can't imagine what it would have looked like, what it would have looked like for Whitley if we would have given up too soon. Can I say there was moments because life got so much harder that we were like, I don't know if we can do this. Maybe, maybe, we, should, maybe we should help him find another family to foster him through this. There was moments where we were struggling and just really wrestling. And if we're honest, it was hard and it was difficult. But I can't even imagine what his life would have looked like if we would have given up too soon. I can't imagine what my marriage would have looked like if we had given up too soon. I can't imagine what my relationship with my kids would have looked like if we had given up too soon. And can I tell you, I can't imagine what my relationship with my Savior would have looked like if I would have given up too soon. Because he was doing a work in me and through me in that season and through our family. And the reality is some of you might be here today and you have a broken marriage. Things haven't been going well. And maybe God's calling you to be obedient and repent of your sin and start to restore that relationship. Maybe you've already started that process and the reality is as you started it, you haven't seen anything back from the other person. But what if, again, what if it's not about how your circumstance changed, but just the fact of walking in obedience with the Lord? What if it, you need to worry less about how things change and just taking the next step of obedience that day? What is God gonna be doing with that? What if it isn't about changing your circumstances, but God changing you? Four years after Whitley came into our life, we had the privilege of adopting him. And we got, he was old enough at this point, he's about four, he was old enough at this point to know everything that was happening. He was part of the entire process. His adoption was one of my, the most joyful moments in my entire life. And we talked to him as we were entering into the process. We said, hey, we wanna change your name, buddy, if you would let us. His name, his middle, his name is Whitley and we're like, we, we would love to name you Caleb Whitley. Because Caleb, uh, if you know his story in scripture, man, we just, we love the story of Caleb. And it's just such a powerful name to us. And we wanted him to go in that power, knowing that God is with him every step of his way. And he wanted to be named Caleb Whitley. And because of that, when we adopted him, that became his name, Caleb Whitley. And he is the joy of our family. Our girls love him. We love him. We couldn't imagine life without him. But can I tell you, I can see why God called us to obedience there, but there's been other times in my life where God's called us to obedience and I still don't know why he called us to obedience. It's not always gonna be clear. It's not always gonna be clear, but I promise you he's working in a mighty and powerful way. And what if, and here leads to my last reflection question for the day is how does your perspective shift when you view obedience as the marker for success? You know, we live in a culture that sees success as financial. Success is stability. Success is how many friends you have. Success, this and this and this and this. And it's very hard for us sometimes to view success through God's eyes. And what if the greatest success we can have in our lives is daily steps in obedience towards him? What if that's the greatest view what is the, if that's the greatest marker for success as a follower of Jesus? How does that change things for you? What does it enable you to do? Because if you need encouragement today, if you go ahead a little bit in the story and you come to Exodus 6, the Lord responds to Moses and he says, now you're gonna see what I'm gonna do because the God we serve is working in mighty ways as we step into obedience. We might not always see it, we might not always feel it. And you know who it reminds me of most of all as we look at Moses' story, it reminds me of, this, reminds me of our savior, Jesus. I don't know why, but I've been reflecting on it a lot in this season in the garden where Jesus is so emotional that he's sweating blood. And he says, take this cup from me, if it be, but it, your will be done. And to obedience, he is broken and beaten. 
nailed to a cross, to obedience for you and for me, he goes to the cross and dies. And he feels all these emotions we're talking about today, right? He, he's criticized and oppressed and opposition comes from his own people, the people he came to rescue. He's feeling lonely on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he's also feeling discouragement because everybody that was walking with him has abandoned him. And in the midst of that, he is still obedient. And we're gonna take communion together. We're gonna come to the table. And as we take communion, I just wanna invite you. I wanna invite you into this moment to ask God to seek his will for your life. Where is he calling you in obedience today? Where is he asking you to step boldly? Maybe it'll be hard, but I promise you he's at work. He's moving and he's gonna use it for his glory and for his purpose. In a moment, I'm gonna pray over the elements and as I pray over the elements, as the worship team plays, I'll invite you to come grab the elements. And as you return back to your seats with the elements, I'll just invite you to go ahead and get them ready for us to take together after the song. If you're up in the balcony and you didn't grab the elements on your way in, you can raise your hand and one of the ushers will get them to you. But let this be a moment to reflect and to ask, God, where are you asking me to step into obedience? so that I can be successful in the only way that matters. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much for your love, your compassion, your mercy, your grace. Thank you for being who you are. God, I pray as we come to this table, as we partake of these elements, as we reflect on your love for us, your mercy, your grace, and the empowerment of your spirit that enables us to do the hard in the midst of the wilderness. Holy Spirit, change, transform, lead us, direct us, make us new. We pray this in the mighty name of King Jesus and all of God's people said, amen.